President, conference, uh, Chris Boff on behalf of the National Executive to present the annual report and I want to repeat immediately the thanks uh, of Janice to every PCS activist for your support and your work. It's our ever-expanding network of reps that we know are the lifeblood of this union. On behalf of Mark and myself, I also want to congratulate Janice, re-elected as President for the 12th occasion, and to the successful candidates on their election to the National Executive Committee, and I also want to thank members of the outgoing NEC for their contribution over the course of the last year. As this government pursues its fire sale of public services, the recent flooding crisis resulting from the wettest winter ever demonstrated yet again the vital role of civil servants and other public sector workers they play as part of the very fabric of our society. From members in the Environment Agency, in EFRA, the Coast Guards, members in HMRC collecting the revenue to fund public services, privatisation and cuts are dismantling the very structures on which society depends for our individual and collective benefit. Now it's fair to say the incoming NEC, in fact the whole union itself, has got a big challenge ahead in the coming year. The government tells us we have a recovery, but of course there's no recovery for the five million public sector workers whose pay is capped at 1%, nor for the 2.3 million unemployed, nor for the many more in working poverty struggling to make ends meet. This is a recovery for the super rich. The combined wealth of the richest people in Britain has actually doubled since the financial crash in 2008. As the author of the Sunday Times Rich List put it, the rich have seen a phenomenal rise in personal wealth in the past 12 months alone. Recent ONS figures state that the richest 1% in Britain today have an accumulated wealth equivalent to the poorest 55% of the population. And if further evidence of the growing inequality in the UK is needed, this is demonstrated in the Oxfam report, A Tale of Two Britons, that illustrates, that, uh, that shows that the five richest families now own more wealth than the poorest 20% of the population. Children are also paying the price of austerity, with the numbers of children in absolute and relative poverty set to increase by hundreds of thousands by the next general election alone. It's clear austerity has taken a toll on public services, on rising poverty, on rising homelessness, and it's also taken a toll on the union's membership figures. And despite that, and thanks to your efforts, our workplace density has actually increased, and we've got to continue to ensure that we recruit every member that we can. So we remain as a union at the forefront of both arguing and organising against austerity. We oppose austerity not just because it's an ideological attack, but because of the very material and damaging effects on the livelihoods and the future of our members and working class communities. But in just 12 months' time, there will be another election. Yes, of course, we want this government out, but this union won't be cheerleading for any party. We will continue to fight against austerity from whatever party or government or devolved area it emanates. But we don't just argue against it, we fight against it. And I want to pay tribute to members in the Land Registry who took two days of strike action just last week to save their service from privatisation. Our members in the Met Police who took strike action... I also want to record our thanks to our members in the Met Police who took strike action earlier this year and won more annual leave and a commitment to address low pay. Members in EFRA and the DWP working in shared services who fought against privatisation and are now fighting to keep their jobs and work from being offshored. On Friday, members in HMRC gave a very important mandate for industrial action over jobs and staffing. And I'd also like to, incidentally, but importantly, like to record thanks for HMRC Rep Sarah Broad and full-time officers Tracy Edwards and Sharon Leslie, who ran the 10-kilometre Brighton race to raise money for the, for the group's hardship fund. But I also want to pay tribute to our young members. This year, celebrating the 10th anniversary of the Young Members Network. It's testament to their commitment, their role in the union, and the vitality that they bring to all of our work. We know also that by standing up for members, reps often put themselves in the firing line, and increasingly so. 
So I will also, as with Janice, want to pay tribute to members in Ofqual who took strike action to defend their victimised rep, Sophia Azam, and pay tribute to Kevin Smith in the Home Office, to Lee Rock and Winston Ressal Singh in DWP, and in fact all reps who are targeted because of the action that they take on behalf of their members. Now our national campaign was endorsed Our national campaign was endorsed following the extensive consultation we undertook between July and September of last year. This was another example, very good example, of our union's democracy, embarking on one of the most extensive and comprehensive consultation and discussions about industrial strategy of any union in the UK trade union movement. We are now consulting branches and groups to ensure that the targeted action and levy plans are being drawn up as part of the sustained programme of action that was identified in the national consultation. And of course we'll be debating that shortly. At the same time, we continue and have been at the forefront for demanding and working for coordinated action as the best chance of winning over public sector wide issues. And the pay freeze, of course, is increasing, increasingly the focus now. We know that the teachers and the firefighters are taking action, and we know local government workers are also being balloted. But let's be clear about this to government, to our employer, and to the trade union movement. This leadership right from the start of austerity, has done everything in its power and will continue to do everything in its power to galvanise the widest opposition to cuts and austerity by building a strategy that delivers for members. We can report, I'm pleased to say, that the mass sustained coordinated action that we called for and led the call for at the TUC in September and was unanimously supported is now a more serious prospect with momentum building for action on the 10th of July. But we also know that we face a significant threat to our union. The plans coordinated by Francis Maud in the Cabinet Office to end check-off and to effectively try and choke off the union's finances. They tried it first in the Department for Communities and Local Government, but thanks to the campaigning of our reps in that area of the union and our legal fight in the High Court, we saw off pickles, but that doesn't mean that the threat has disappeared. We know that they're looking at other departments too. We've also engaged in political campaigning and showed opposition to the Chekhov threat from the Labour Party and from the SNP in Scotland. But of course, we cannot be complacent. There's still another year left, at least, of this coalition government. Confronted with the threat, the switch to direct debit is about making our union's finances independent of the employer, protecting our ability to function, ensuring we remain a strong and independent, powerful union. Now, as a union, of course, we want to be the strongest and most effective possible that delivers for members who set the agenda through the democratic processes that exist within the union. Over the past 12 years, PCS has been built into one of the most respected unions in the country. That's a tribute, I would argue, not just to the leadership, but to yourselves, to the reps and to the members too. Together, we built a strong union of which we can all be proud. But as the financial report shows, which I'll present on Wednesday, we are a financially robust and sustainable union, despite some scurrilous reports to the contrary. We are a democratic campaigning union, often giving the lead in fighting austerity and putting our alternative within the TUC. So the debate that we have about the merger with Unite is about whether we can further strengthen the union's bargaining power for our members and strengthening our ability to fight back more effectively. It should be remembered, of course, that PCS itself came about as a result of a merger to achieve these same, same ends. And when we're faced with policies that are imposed across the whole of the public sector, we need a public sector-wide response. And of course, Unite organised local government in NHS and education, and again it opens up the potential of a powerful force within the public sector. Now, of course, later in the conference we'll discuss how we proceed, but whatever decisions we take, we will go forward in the democratic, open way that you would expect from PCS. Now, as Janice said, our movement has lost two giants this year, Tony Benn and Bob Crow. Both Bob and Tony supported this union, supported members in dispute, spoke at our rallies and meetings, and were great support of everything that we've tried to achieve. 
they recognised the class nature of society and a form of trade unionism that is part of a wider struggle for socialist ideas. And as Bob, Bob Crow said, when challenged on the pay rates of rail workers, it's only through militant fighting unions that you ever win decent concessions from your members. Like PCS, Bob recognised that effective trade unionism is based on hard bargaining backed up by a willingness to take industrial action. Now a great example, I would say, that reinforces the reputation of this unions and its, and its democracy is over the question of Scottish independence. Our February conference in Scotland showed the very best of PCS, coming together to openly discuss, and passionately discuss I should say, as well as openly, what would be in the interests of our members north of the border and in the, across the UK. Their conclusion, which the NEC is asking you to endorse at this conference, is that our union takes a PCS informs, you decide approach. This means taking our arguments for an alternative to austerity, for properly resourced public services, for jobs, for fairness, to all sides of the constitutional debate in the run-up to the referendum in September and beyond. In contrast to virtually every other union in Scotland, our democratic and open processes, our union adopted, we can be proud of and is consistent, again, with a democracy that I think all of us hold dear. Few Scottish delegates, of course, are neutral on this issue, but they recognised that an active engagement around the debate, seeing what a yes and no vote would deliver for members without taking one side or another, is the right position at this moment for our union. It's not constraining us in any way, but it will help us to win concessions for our members and, most importantly, influence the wider debate. We are, of course, a campaigning union. I want to pay tribute to the unsung day-to-day -day victories in the workplace that our members and activists secure, to the vibrant campaigns that we've been engaged in over the course of the last year, to save the land registry, to fight for a living wage, the campaigns in the culture sector around zero hours and recognition, to keep open the 281 walk-in tax offices, for defending workplace nurseries, for an agreement on a living wage in all debt contracts that we now need to fight for across the rest of the civil service, the fight against oppressive conditions in contact centres, and the fight to save the independent living fund. And I want to pay tribute to our members in the commercial sector in Capita and Cofley, who have won improved offers on pay and job security, again following the threat of strike action. What is remarkable about our union is not just the diversity within our membership, but also the diversity of the organisations that we work with in advancing members' interests, both at work and in a wider sense. We are proud to work alongside our sister unions, like the uh, Unite, like RMT, like POA, and many, many others, of working through the Trades Councils, of building campaigning alliances with groups like Disabled People Against Cuts, UK on Cuts, National Pensioners Convention, and of course, climate activists. We're equally proud that PCS consistently doesn't just say what we're against, but constantly argues what we're in favour of. For public ownership, for one million climate jobs, for safeguarding welfare provision based on equality and defending the unemployed against benefit sanctions. For over a decade now, we've also built an effective voice in Parliament to make sure your voice is heard by the politicians. And I, on behalf of the National Executive, I want to thank John McDonnell, the Chair of our Parliamentary Group, and all its members, and I'm sure we want to give John a warm welcome when he addresses conference tomorrow. Conference, I'm also pleased, despite the bleak terrain, I'm also pleased to note two great victories in Parliament this year, uh, this past year. Firstly, that we saved the general equality duty, which this government wanted to strip away. And secondly, we finally gained the right to equal marriage. Now, <laughs> so to finish conference, by bargaining and campaigning in our workplaces, in groups, in regions, our willingness to take industrial action and the political pressure that we exert means we do and can win victories and have stopped some of the worst excesses of this government and the employer. We have achieved a lot in the course of the last year 
even in particularly and very difficult circumstances. We have a lot to discuss and a lot to decide in the next few days. We've got a hell of a lot of campaigning and organising to do in the next 12 months. But I know, and this leadership knows, with your commitment, we can be ever stronger as a union in workplaces and in our communities, that we can continually build up the bargaining power of this union, that we can reach out to the millions of super exploited, particularly young workers, looking for the protection of trade unionism, and in the process, dispel the fatalism that has afflicted political protest and trade union struggle in this country for far too long by demonstrating in word and in deed what is actually possible. Conference, I move the annual report.